Our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Wood. John is a longtime resident of uh, Ogden. He is uh, a family practice physician who um, did his family practice residency in California. He uh, retired from his family practice um, and is now uh, the medical director of the Intermountain Healthcare Hospice Unit here in Ogden. And he will be talking about the latest developments in hospice. John? Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. I want to start out by uh, talking about a patient uh, that we had on hospice a few years ago. Uh, he's a young guy, about 53, with uh, metastatic rectal cancer. And he was getting tumors uh, coming through his groin all around the perineum. Tumors were becoming um, exophytic and fungating, and, and he was deteriorating quite quickly. And when we first saw him, we uh, started talk to, uh, talking to him and we put him on <clears throat> pain medication and tried to spiff him up as best we could. And, but he never wanted to talk about dying and he never would talk to me about it. I'd go and all he'd want to do is talk about golf and how much he wanted to golf and, and would not talk about in, any end of life issues. And as the disease progressed, he became weaker and the tumors were growing and I, I put him on some steroids, uh, thinking that might temporarily shrink the tumor and uh, maybe increase his appetite. And he actually improved quite a bit. The tumors were visibly shrinking and his appetite was improving. He even gained a little bit of weight. But he was still quite weak and one day I went and talked to him and he said, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. He says, I think I want to go back to Huntsman Cancer Institute and get some more chemo. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's up to you, and we can make that happen if you would like to. And um, we will do everything in our power to make that happen. But let me tell you, I think that the improvement you're seeing is due to the steroids, and, and that won't continue. And eventually the tumors will grow again, and your appetite will disappear, and you'll start losing weight again, and, and your fatigue will come back. And he said, okay, well, let me think about it. And I want to stop right there and maybe have you remember that patient. The, um, what's new in hospice is um, actually hospices. There, are, there has been a virtual explosion of hospices in uh, the United States. Um, when I, <clears throat> the first hospice was, sorry, the first hospices was founded in 1974. It was a volunteer hospice in, uh, in New England. And uh, after 1982, when the hospice benefit was created, there's just been a, a tremendous explosion. Every year there's more and more hospices. This slide is of 2007, there were 4,700. At the end of 2008, there were 5,200 hospices in the United States. Am I pointing this at the wrong way? When I started in hospice in about 2002, there were 25 hospices in Utah and as of the end of December, there were 106 hospices just in Utah. Most are for-profit, um, and there's only a few that are not for-profit. Most of the uh, hospices in the in country are not for are for-profit, although the percentage is a lot higher outside of Utah. It's of 40-something percent are are uh, not for profit, profit hospices. The number of patients that are served by hospice. Uh, went over a million in 2004, 
And as at the end of last year, uh, over 1,400,000 patients were served by hospices. Last year, there were 4.3 million births in the United States and 2.5 million deaths. 900,000 people died on hospice, which is now approaching 40 percent. If you look at people in the general population, more than half die in the hospital. 50 percent will die in the hospital in spite of several studies that have indicated the patient's desire is to die at home. That is, that is their most common wish. If you look at hospice patients, 74% will die at the place they do call home, which is, can be their home, a nursing home, an assisted living, residential facility. 17% will die in an inpatient hospice facility. There's one in Utah in Salt Lake City. And 8% die in the hospital. Now, the modern hospice was created in 1982. It was, it was uh, uh, created by Congress as part of the TEFRA uh, Tax Act. And they just picked a number out of the sky and said, we'll make it, if they have a less than six-month prognosis, then they're appropriate for hospice. And that was the Medicare benefit. Later, Medicaid started offering hospice benefits in most states now, and and now we're seeing third-party carriers frequently will have a form of a hospice benefit. The Medicare benefit is two 90-day periods. They're benefit periods that, uh, followed by an unlimited number of 60-day periods. The, um, the initial period has to be certified by two, posi two physicians. One is the um, hospice medical director and the other one is the, the referring physician. At, the, at every certification, then they, um, it only needs to be certified by one physician. Now, this, uh, people can stay on hospice as long as they need to. In fact, people graduate from hospice. Not everyone dies. People quit declining. There are several diagnoses that are, make them appropriate for hospice, and some people just don't decline and uh, are discharged from hospice. Um, and then eventually uh, readmitted. The modern hospice is a team approach. It includes the medical director, a nurse, social worker, chaplain, pharmacist, and volunteers. Uh, this, this group makes up what's called the interdisciplinary team, or the IDT, and that meets on every patient every two weeks to go over how, uh, how things are going to make sure the symptoms are managed. The diagnosis most commonly for hospice in the United States is cancer, which uh, is, uh, counts for 44 percent. Debility is another big one. Uh, at least in Utah, it's, it's quite a bit more than the 12 percent uh, nationally. That is failure to thrive or the dwindles or think people that are declining with no real apparent cause. Uh, heart disease accounts for 12 percent. There's a category for dementia, pulmonary disease, liver disease, ALS, stroke and coma, renal disease, and HIV. And there are, Medicare has developed certain criteria uh, to go through to, make, to see if they're appropriate uh, with these diagnoses. There's a big misconception in hospice and about hospice in the United States, I think, and, and it's probably fostered a lot by the media. And I think you talk to people and they will, uh, some, sometimes they think hospice is all about dying, and morphine is used commonly, and it's just to, to make them comfortable or to crank the dose up and, and let them pass away comfortably. Well, um, the media has been a problem. You want to start that uh, video? This is a clip from Boston Hello, Legal. Dr. Bromfield. Shirley Schmidt. Nice to meet you, though not under these circumstances. Uh, this is Denny Crane. Hello. I wish I could tell you something positive. I'm afraid the best we can do is try and keep him calm. Her I don't dare father him. has I'm concerned that he'll re-injure his ribs. I would like to hook him up to a morphine drip, please. His injuries are causing him considerable pain. I'd like this done as soon as possible. I am... Um... He, he seems to be comfortable now. He's not. I know him better than you. I'd like the drip, please. Yes, Smith. 
I can't do what you're asking me to do. I'm asking you to manage his pain, doctor. I'm very sorry. I don't think a morphine drip is indicated here. Let's heal. Is he still chief of staff? He is. Get him. Look, I know what you're asking for, and I sympathize. My own father died of Alzheimer's. You know this, Denny. But we have laws. This goes on all the time, you know that. Well, it happens sometimes with, as I said, patients in severe physical pain. But look at him. How do we couch this as pain management? You simply believe me when I tell you that he is hurting. Come on, Ned. We're not asking for anything that doesn't happen in every hospital every day. I can't. But if you get a court order forcing our hand... I suppose we'll have no choice but to abide. I'll argue it myself. Let's go. Thank you, Doctor. Now, Boston Legal is my favorite show, but they're frequently wrong. And this is, and I do not believe that this goes on in every hospital every day. And I've never been in a hospital where it's happened. I've never talked to anybody that, that does this. And we use a lot of opioids in in hospice there are there is data now that people actually live longer on hospice from the journal of pain and symptom management uh, two years ago they had a, a study of 4500 patients and terminally ill with either cancer or congestive heart failure the mean survival was 29 days longer on hospice as as off of hospice Colon cancer, they live 33 days longer. Pancreatic, 21 days. Lung cancer, 39 days. And congestive heart failure, 81 days longer. And there's now several studies indicating that using opioids and sedatives in terminally ill people does not um, hasten death. This, this study... Uh, showed there were no significant differences between survival in patients who received quite high doses of opioids, uh, some between 240 and 600 milligrams of morphine or oral morphine equivalent in a 48-hour period. It was also true for those on benzodiazepines and up to 59 milligrams in 48 hours and metazolam up to, up to or greater than 60 uh, milligrams in a 48-hour period, uh, that it did not hasten their their de uh, demise. They di they concluded that opioids were safe, and as long as they were administered with a low initial dosage and adequate titration. In JAMA in 2004, there was an article on the goals of medicine, and we all can relate to the first five but we pay very little attention to assisting in a peaceful death. And there are six components of a good death. Pain and symptom management, uh, allowing clear decision making, preparation for death, uh, allowing them to have completion, contributing to others, and affirmation of the whole person. Well, in hospice, we're all about symptoms. That's, that's mainly what we do. The patients have decided they want no active treatment. They want to forego any further uh, aggressive active treatment and hospitalizations. And when they sign on for the, for the hospice benefit, uh, we manage their symptoms. And we do it in lots of ways, creative ways. We use it orally, sublingually, buccal, rectally, IV, subcutaneously. We do a lot of infusions of morphine, Ativan, other uh, benzodiazepines uh, subcutaneously uh, through a butterfly. And we have concentrated liquids and so fluid is rarely, uh, the amount of fluid we're giving sub-Q is rarely a problem. Uh, we use topical medicines, we use inhaled medicines, intranasal, and we, but we do try to avoid IM because of the people at end stage with very little muscle mass and are cachectic, it can be painful and the absorption is somewhat erratic. Let me talk for a minute about opioids. Um, they're the mainstay of what we do. 
we kind of look at opioids as we, we try to equate them all to what, it, what they would uh, equate in morphine equivalents. Uh, this is a short chart of what uh, 30 milligrams of morphine equals 20 milligrams of oxycodone and t equals 7.5 of hydromorphone. Um, this is in your, on your disk, but I do have a more complete uh, a one-page chart that I'll put out front uh, as, a, as a handout if, you, if you're interested. It's from a, uh, some of our other literature, and I printed that off if you want to pick that up. And it even includes methadone. Um, methadone is, a, is actually a whole other subject. Um, the f forms of morphine um, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, MS Contin is a stain relief form. It comes in various dosages, and it, it's uh, dosed every 12 hours according to the PDR, but as in everyone that's ever done any hospice, it doesn't last 12 hours most of the time, and we frequently end up dosing it every eight hours. It cannot be chewed, but it can, um, it can be given rectally. The, um, the, the tablets of morphine are called morphine sulfate instant release, MF, MSIR, and that is a misnomer. It's really normal release. There's nothing instant about it. And we use a lot of roxanol, which is a uh, concentrated liquid at 20 milligrams per milliliter. And we usually get a 30 cc bottle and try and put it in the home. There is misconceptions about roxanol, in, uh, even in hospices, and I see this all the time among nurses. We use morphine a lot for shortness of breath at end of life, and it works extremely well. But what many nurses will tell you, oh, I gave him a few drops of morphine on his tongue and I could just see within a couple of minutes he was so relaxed and he was breathing easier and this is such a great drug. Well, the kinetics of oral morphine are exactly like the tablet form, which is exactly like tablet Lortab, exactly like Percocet. Its onset is around 20 minutes, peaks in about an hour, and it's gone in three or four. The liquid morphine is not absorbed sublingually or buccally. It's swallowed. That's how that works. And as with anything, there's probably a large placebo effect here. It does work, and um, it, see, it just takes longer than people are, are willing to, to admit. The, and I, I still struggle with it. I see hospice nurses putting morphine in the home as an emergency medicine for, for shortness of breath when they have Lortab or Percocet that they're taking and do, doing just fine. And I, it's just duplicating medications and confusing the patients. But oral morphine, it just works just like a, a tablet. There is, um, you're all familiar with fentanyl. It's an extremely lipophilic uh, medication. The patches have been very helpful. They now come in 12, 25, 50, and 100 microgram per hour patches, and they're changed every three days. Now, we do change them every 48 hours sometimes as people t tends to wear off towards that end of that 72-hour period, and we'll frequently change the patches um, every 48 hours. Uh, once you start a patch, it takes about 18 hours for it to uh, build up and achieve steady state. So you can't just put a patch on and think it's going to fix them right away. That It takes about 18 hours, and they need to use their breakthrough medicine if you're rotating them to a patch. You've all, the, you've all heard of the oral transmucosal fentanyl citrate, or the actique suckers. They come in the doses of 200 to 12, uh, 1,600 micrograms. There is no way to take a, uh, some uh, patient's dose of morphine and, and try to figure out how much actique sucker is going to work. It's just it's too difficult a calculation and is rarely, rarely helpful. Actique was touted as a very rapid acting thing. They were using it as suckers in the emergency room initially in kids, thinking it would help calm them down while they're waiting to get their lacerations sewed up. Uh, because they would suck on it, it was absorbed through the mucosa and worked extremely fast. But that's probably not true either. They, Actique is only 25% absorbed through the mucosa, mainly because of its uh, lipophilicity that will allow it to get through the mucosa. Um, 
but there is one that probably truly is, and that is a relatively new uh, pill called Fentora or the fentanyl buckle tablets. And that, um, they took this tablet and they took the fentanyl citrate and they coated it with a um, bicarb, sodium bicarb, and made it kind of an effervescent uh, tablet. And you put it between your gum and the cheek, usually on, uh, on the upper on the upper gum, and then it dissolves. The, it must cha they feel it changes the pH of the, at, uh, at the uh, site where it's being absorbed, and it's, and it's absorbed a lot faster. Um, that's why these tablets come in less than the Actique. They're at exactly half of what Actique is. But it's it's only 50% absorbed transmucosally. The rest is, is swallowed. But it does have an onset of 7 to 10 minutes. It peaks in 30, or 40, 30 to 40 minutes and lasts about 3 hours or less. It is not equivalent to the suckers. And you've got to be very careful if you have somebody on, on the suckers and you're going to switch them to the Fentora tablets. You've got to be very careful and at least have that dosage because the absorption is different. This is just a a graph of uh, plasma concentration after a single dose. So the times are not exactly what you would r read av after big studies. This is a single dose study. The, uh, uh, this graph is, uh, the bottom one is Actic, or the fentanyl suckers. And you can see that the time to, on the onset of Actic is probably somewhere around 40 minutes is where they'll start, it'll start giving some pain relief. And it'll peak, clear out here, at about 90 minutes or greater. As compared to the Fentora, the fentanyl 